Jeff and I met um, just, just over a year ago and immediately um, found common ground in bringing together thought leaders and experts from around the world to you know, address challenges at warp speed. And I'm going to leave it to you to introduce the rest. But Got it. it's lovely to have you here. Excellent. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, uh, great to have you. How many of you are uh, familiar with Singularity University? Can I just see a show of hands? A bunch of you. All right. And uh, so my uh, journey starts uh, about a dozen years ago when I was the head of innovation at Yahoo, uh, running their incubator. And I learned a really fundamental lesson, which is when you attempt disruptive innovation in any large organization, the immune system attacks you. Because right, all of our organizations are built to resist change and withstand risk, and yet that's now the high order bit. And how do we deal with that tension is almost all of the work that I do uh, today. I'll just wait. For, uh, so uh, a, a few years ago, I'm the founding executive director at Singularity <laughs> University. Uh, I, I, as I mentioned, my starter at Yahoo, I then went on to become the... The, one of the founders of Singularity University built it out for a few years. Uh, I'm now on the board of the XPRIZE Foundation. Uh, and almost all my work now is how do you think about that particular problem of this immune system? Because when we have new technologies, we have a societal resistance and organizational resistance to it. And how do we deal with that, with that problem is almost all of the work that I do here. I'm actually Canadian, uh, originally from India. Actually, I have permanent residency in the UK, which is getting more and more useless by the day, uh, but uh, we won't get into that too much. Um, this graph, I think, is where a lot of the thinking around AI starts. Uh, Ray Kurzweil, who's one of the leading uh, scientists and thinkers in the world today, put this chart together of Moore's Law. And he goes all the way back to 1900 and finds that we've been doubling computational price performance for over 100 years, way before Gordon Moore made his predictions. And the question that he asked when he saw this data is, why is this curve so smooth and so predictable? Uh, through wars, recessions, ups and downs in the industry, you should expect a very jagged stock market type of shape to this, not this very steady progression. And he spent a full 10 years trying to researching this, trying to understand why is this happening? Why is this so smooth, predictable, stable, et cetera? And he came up with a really fundamental observation which now drives most of the thinking in the emerging technologies world, which is once you take a domain, discipline, industry area, product area, technology, you, and you power it with information technologies and data and AI, you start this doubling pattern. And most importantly, once that doubling pattern starts, it does not stop. And cognitively, we have a very difficult time with this because you expect it to level off. It can't keep going, et cetera, et cetera. If you can see the bands here, in, uh, uh, in computation, we've had multiple technologies, relays, vacuum tubes, transistors, now integrated circuits. You can think of each one as an S-curve where a technology takes off, accelerates, reaches its upper capabilities. But if you have an information-based paradigm, something else always takes over the curve. And that's the underlying secret. And so today, we're actually reaching the end of the life cycle of integrated circuits. Uh, the chips are getting very hot. We're down to a few nanometers wire thickness. But now we have uh, several technologies clustering at the edge of this, ready to take it to the next level. Uh, 3D chip design, optical computing, probably quantum computing is the most likely candidate, although it requires a lot of alcohol to get into, and it's a little too early in the day to get into that right now. Um, and so that's the core of this uh, starting point of this. Uh, Peter Diamandis, who's the founder of Singularity and also the founder of the XPRIZE Foundation, uh, which gives large public prizes. You heard a little bit about XPRIZE yesterday. Peter wrote this book called Abundance, charting out that if we can actually harness this acceleration and harness this doubling pattern, we'll soon have an abundance of uh, healthcare, education, clean water, energy in about a decade. And what does the world look like if, if that's the case? So that foundation of our thinking leads us to a whole bunch of really interesting thoughts. Uh, I'm now on the board of the XPRIZE Foundation, which has some rather interesting characters uh, on it. Um, pretty much every board meeting starts with, what did Elon just do? And then we move on to the rest of the, of the business of the day. But this particular prize just got awarded, which was absolutely unbelievable. And the prize was, could you create a machine that would extract 2,000 liters of water a day out of the atmosphere using only renewable energy for less than two cents a liter. Okay? And we expected this prize to take about five or seven or eight years to be won. And six months ago, last October, we awarded this prize. And we now have a machine that can extract 2,000 liters out of the atmosphere. As long as you're not in desert conditions, there's enough humidity to do this. We're now talking to the president of South Africa, 
uh, Indonesia, Thailand, about how do you commercialize this? Because there's a million villages in Africa, a million villages in Indonesia, every condo building in the world or a block of flats could use this technology. Uh, there's the winning team unexpectedly. And what we're finding today is this un un unbelievable democratization of technology where breakthroughs come from unexpected places. Uh, the key thinking behind Singularity University and the observation we made when we created that was that that doubling pattern that we've seen in computation and we've lived through for the last few decades with our devices, we're now seeing that in a dozen technologies. And this is completely unique. In the history of our world, at any given point, any, uh, maybe one technology was accelerating or another, never have we seen a dozen at the same time. In, in uh, neuroscience, the resolution at which we can image the brain is doubling every year. Right? This, the the uh, drones are doubling every nine months in their capability and so on. And that doubling pattern gives us unbelievable possibilities, but very, very hard to think about and very, very hard to map to. Now, we found that when you go through this process, we're going through kind of four major dynamics in the world that are driving, being driven by this. Obviously, we're digitizing the world very rapidly. Right? Our, our memories aren't in our heads anymore. They're in our smartphones. All our uh, relationships are now digital because of, of uh, uh, social media rather than analog. And when you look at AI, AI helps to make sense of all of that. And you add AI to the data that's being generated and then some of the other tools, the applications become pretty unbelievable. Obvi the reason we have AI is we've not had an upgrade in our brains in about 50,000 years. If your iPhones were 50,000 years old, you would be deeply unhappy with, with it. We have a lot of old biases and heuristics and human cognition. And we can now use uh, machine learning, pattern recognition, and so on to mitigate for these biases. Uh, some of you are familiar with this uh, study of a thousand parole hearings, should you release a prisoner from jail or not. And it turned out if you came up for parole just before lunch and the judges were hungry, you were going back to jail. If you came up just after lunch and they were biologically happier because they'd eaten, 30% more likely that you would go free. Right? And this isn't people trained to be impartial, so what, you know, what hope is there for the rest of us? But now we can actually find these perturbations and mitigate for these issues and these kind of frailties of the human cognition. And this is where I think the magic of AI really applies in one of these areas. And you'll hear more from my fellow speakers in the other one. And of course, when you put AI into things that move, you have robotics. We're all familiar with these $20 helicopters. 10 or so years ago, that capability cost $700. And 12 or 13 years ago, that wasn't even possible. So something just wasn't possible a dozen years ago, now we throw it away in a toy. And drones are doubling, as I said, every nine months in their capability. Um, uh, now, we found that when you digitize, things become very, very disruptive. And the best framing we have found for this is photography. Uh, some of you are actually old enough to remember film photography. You're oper operating on a physical substrate, and you're operating from a scarcity model. You can only carry so much film, costs about a euro a photograph, takes a few days to get your prints back. You may go to digital photography and you go to the information-based environment, three interesting things happen. First, marginal cost goes to zero. Right now I can take a thousand photographs, the cost doesn't change. As a result of that, the domain explodes. In film photography, I'm very carefully clicking here or there, but today we're holding the button down and taking billions of times more photographs because the cost is gone. But the third thing that's very subtle but very important from a business perspective and relatedly to financial services is that you change the problem space. So in a scarcity problem space, you get a whole bunch of business models cropping up around that scarcity, right? Uh, expensive cameras, uh, courses on photography, high-end dark rooms and equipment, uh, books on composition. But you move to digital photography and the problem space is now the following. We all have eight copies of our photographs on 10 devices and you can't find anything. And you've gone from a sourcing problem to a filtering problem, right? Nobody can make money teaching courses on photography today. And this fundamental change in business model is what's leaving a lot of the incumbents behind. In many industries, they're optimized towards a physical, material, scarcity, incremental view of the world, and the underlying pattern is changing. We're seeing this shift in all of these technologies. They're all going through this explosion which is what's leading to those doubling patterns and so on. I'll touch one industry where we're seeing this happen in a very dramatic fashion, which is solar energy, <clears throat> which is now on this doubling pattern. Solar energy is doubling in its price performance every 22 months. If you can see the charts, it's been doing this for 40 years. So for 40 years, we've been doubling price performance of solar roughly every two years. 
at this pace, we will be able to deliver 100% of world energy supply with solar in 12 years. We are six doublings away from that. Which is energy! Thank you, Jose. Uh, Jose is one of our rather eclectic faculty uh, that deals with this. Um, so you think about that one breakthrough. Right? In 12 years, we get to that point. This has massive geopolitical implications. The Middle East collapses. Uh, the US has to find other reasons to go to war, uh, et cetera, et cetera. All sorts of ripple effects. I, I'm, as a Canadian, 40% of Canadian exports are oil. So the basis of the Canadian economy is going to be totally destabilized in the next few years. And because they're Canadian, they're not doing anything about it. Uh, uh, here's the relative cost of solar to other fuels. You can see the unbelievable multiplier effect that we're seeing there. Um, and here's this graph of unbelievable cost drops in solar energy. Two really important things about this. One, if we can deliver 100% in 12 years, we have to remember that that doubling pattern doesn't stop. So if we can deliver 100% in 12 years, in 14 years, we can deliver 200%. In 16 years, we can deliver 400%. In 18 years, we can deliver 800%. And that just keeps going. So energy, which has been scarce for the entire history of humanity, is about to become abundant, and which will completely change the world. The poorest countries in the world are the sunniest countries in the world. Right? And so that completely changes the equation there. We're now starting to see that happen. Almost all of the ranches in the Australian outback are solar-powered. About a quarter of the farms in California are solar-powered. Chile, in the country of Chile and South America, they are generating so much solar energy today, they're giving it to their neighbors for free. That is happening right now. So if you're invested in oil and gas, get out or uh, enjoy the consequences. Um, maybe my favorite uh, paradigm in all of this is this particular little story where the coal museum in Kentucky is using solar panels to power itself, and I just don't know how you look in the mirror on this one. How do you look in the mirror on this one? And so this the, you see this kind of perturbation when you have these broad inflection points. You have these weird oddities when you think about the world. Now, of course, the big challenge is storage. How do you store all that energy in hilly areas? People are pumping water up hills during the day and using hydro at night. Wind tends to be counter-cyclical to solar. Uh, battery technology is lagging behind solar, but only by about five years. So in about four or five years, when you have solar and storage at the same level of maturity, uh, it means the business model of every electrical utility in the world disappears. Right? And that will have some interesting impact. Now, how do you think about wealth management if you can't rely on uh, f uh, fuel um, uh, fossil fuels, uh, utilities, et cetera, et cetera. I actually tried to live this myself. If you're going to talk about this, you have to have some experiential basis behind this. So a couple of years ago, I took a Tesla and I drove uh, from Miami all the way up to Toronto. Uh, 2,500 kilometers, I would get on the motorway, I would hit the button for autonomous driving, and the car drove itself about 35% of the time. You know, if it got, got, saw road cones, it would get a bit, bit confused. If it ran into construction, it would get lose its way, et cetera, et cetera. So that was interesting, quite a fun trip, et cetera. More interestingly, uh, a year ago or so, I drove it back. So in 18 months, here's the, the, the difference. It was a slightly shorter trip, as you can see. Uh, but look at this bottom row. When I drove it up, the car drove itself, as I said, about 35% of the time. When I drove it back, same car, same sensors, is now driving itself 80% of the time. Right? And that is a Gutenberg moment. That is a profound shift in how we think about the world. And, and the, the only difference is better data, better AI, better analytics, that many more cars have mapped the roads, et cetera, et cetera. And you can see that shift in the hardware. So talk about software eating the world. There you go in real time. Um, and here's the way I'd like to frame this. Think about this idea. I got into this car, which is essentially a first-class train cabin. It carried me across the country. 80% of the time by itself. And because the charging stations are free, the entire trip, 2,500 kilometers, cost me zero. Cost me zero. From a financial services perspective, that should give us pause. How do you finance something that costs zero? Right? Or doesn't require any money going forward? Nowadays, when we go back and forth, I say to my wife, you fly, I'll drive the car. I made like 60 conference calls along the way, loaded up with five of my favorite shawarmas, and I ate and talked and drove the whole time. It was a ton of fun. 
And why would I give up that kind of an experience? And how will we think about the world as this goes on, right? Now, the big challenge we have is although the technology, I would frame it today, that driven by AI and so on, we have about 20 Gutenberg moments hitting us all at the same time. Because just solar energy changes the world completely. Then you add in blockchain, then you add in robotics, then you add in biotech breakthroughs, then you add in neuroscience breakthroughs. We have never seen this before. And the big challenge that we have is this is really threatening and disrupting all of our institutions. Because our institutions, the mechanisms by which we run the world, are not set up for this. All of the instruments, our healthcare systems, legal systems, intellectual property, political systems, all designed for a world a few hundred years ago. Right? Take representative democracies. We invented those a few hundred years ago when information was scarce. If you're in Washington, D.C., you literally had no idea what was happening in California. The speed of a horse was as fast as you could find out. Today, we have an abundance of information, gets misused, uh, faked, et cetera, et cetera, and every major democracy in the world is broken. The metabolism of a democracy is not set up to operate in the pace of the world today. And that's a huge challenge. Uh, or take uh, religions. We've had uh, this discussion at the Vatican. Their business model is to sell heaven. As we have life extension coming driven by AI and better healthcare technologies, how do you sell heaven if you're not, people aren't dying? Or on a lighter note, take the institution of marriage. We invented that about 9,000 years ago. And when the institution of marriage first surfaced, average lifespan was about 23 years old. So you got married and you had kids and you died. Marriage is not supposed to last 50, 60 years, right? My wife calls it state-sanctioned torture, okay? And then we worry about the divorce rate. And so we're gonna have an enormous challenge. You see the stress in the world today. The orthodox element in every religion is freaking out. Hindu nationalists, Muslim radicals, Christian evangelicals, Jewish settlers, they're all saying, let's go back to an older time because people would much rather be comfortable than happy. And this is the enormous challenge we have from how to think about the world. One last point around this is that the big question about will AI take all the jobs, we fundamentally disagree with. Wherever we can measure it, it turns out that AI does not take jobs. Uh, take ATM machines. When we created those, we thought that would be the end of all bank tellers. And all these stories were published wondering, what are we going to do with millions of bank tellers? How will we deal with this? Well, what actually happened was the cost of running a branch dropped very dramatically. The banks created a ton more branches, and the number of bank tellers has not reduced at all. Right? Or take Germany, where we pretty much automated almost all the factories in Germany. There's almost nobody working on the factory floors because of AI and robotics. Employment hasn't gone down at all. And what happens is we get freaked out by our amygdala, our nervous system, which looks at new, th new technologies as danger, and we freak out about it. So when the uh, autonomous car first arrives, the first reaction is, oh my God, let's ban the car. Right? How many of you have watched the shopping cart uh, analogy about should a car decide to hit a human being, a, a grandmother, or a bunch of school kids? Have you seen this? Okay. I hate, I hate, I hate that debate. Right? The reason is, let me ask you a simple question. When was the last time you had to make that choice? Never. When was the last time you heard of anybody having to make that choice? Never. When was the last time you read about that? Never. So we're worrying about this edge case. Meanwhile, we're killing 1.2 million people a year with car accidents. And I remember the agriculture minister in Africa, one of the countries, said it best, warning about technologies and golden rice shipments and new technologies. It's great to have the debate. Can we eat first? And I think that summarizes pretty well. Now, from an economic perspective, we're seeing a huge deflationary dynamic when you see something digitized, and that has enormous challenges. But the big challenge is when you have new technologies, we don't see that doubling pattern, and it totally disrupts us. So uh, the, the LIDAR you know, at the top of this Prius cost $75,000 seven years ago, and now that's about $40. Why? Because there's two or three technologies in it, each doubling every year, the aggregate effect is unbelievable. And if you want an example of the immune system, go back to the car industry 10 years ago, run this little thought experiment, and walk into an executive and say, this will cost almost nothing in seven years, and you'll be laughed out of the room. Or you'll be given a white coat and some medicine and asked to stand in the corner. And maybe this is the graph that highlights the most, and I'll, I'll be, I'm almost done. So this is the actual graph of solar energy, doubling uh, dramatically over the last couple of decades, as you can see. What you see here in the colored lines is the predictions from the top energy experts in the world as to what will happen with solar. And what you see is that every single point of actually steep acceleration, the energy experts go, go horizontal. At every single point. That guy up there, it's gone like this, and he goes, no, it's going to go this way. 
In fact, some of them go down. How do you get that solar will go down when the price is crashing to near zero? And this we've seen across industries and across paradigms. If you have experts in your industry or your company, they will all not see this pattern, this cognitive issue. This is what I call the immune system. And the reason this is unstoppable is that all of these technologies going through this kind of a curve where domain becomes digital, the costs go to zero, you get very radical disruption of the status quo. The blockchain is open source and free. It's just a matter of time when that disrupts the world. The only thing holding things back right now is regulatory. And if you're tracking it, the European Central Bank just came out and said, we will not be able to regulate cryptocurrencies. Interesting, right? Now today, any entrepreneur can enter a legacy environment with a beginner's mind, leverage new technologies and totally disrupt it. Elon Musk's methodology is really simple. He looks at a technology that's growing exponentially. He looks where will it be in 10 years and aims to build a company to intercept that curve in 10 years. And to give you an example of the mindset that that's now possible, I was chatting with him about this. And I said, Elon, I have a degree in theoretical physics. If you accelerate a human being from zero to 4,000 miles an hour and then decelerate them to back to zero in a short period of time, you're probably going to kill them. And his response was, yes, it's an issue. Right? It's an issue. I'm look, relating to it as a totally impossible problem, and he's relating to his issue. That's what's possible today. And this is what's very dramatic today. Um, so today we're able to deal with this. We actually have tool sets for how to think about this, and we've been working on tools as to how do you solve the way we organize ourselves. And that's what we work on today, is how do you solve this immune system problem? We actually cracked that problem. We found tools that allow you to move leadership, culture, management thinking three years ahead in 10 weeks. And we're so excited by the outcomes of this. We're actually open sourcing the methodology. I'll just skip you through this uh, pattern here. Uh, we've done it a whole bunch of times in a bunch of companies. Um, in terms of solving this immune system problem in large organizations, we're releasing a second book that comes out uh, this week on uh, basically documenting that methodology. And so if anybody's interested, let us know about that. So thank you very much. I uh, hope you have a great conference. I hope I've given you some sense of how broader than AI the world is moving. AI is one of the core tools that help us drive change in the world. Thank you very much. Uh, what a horrible job. I literally wanted to listen to more and more of that, and yet I was having to like rush Salim through. So uh, yeah, I'll be following on Twitter and just, just tweet the rest of your presentation so we get it. Um, right, next up, can we welcome to the stage, please, Ashok Vaswani and Majol Saxena, who are going to talk about the Barclays of the future. Welcome to the stage, please. Uh, you want to sit here? Okay. Right here, so. uh, well, good morning. Uh, is there a timer, or can someone give me like a five-second heads up? Okay, great. Thank you. So, Ashok, uh, thank you for joining us here at COGX, and uh, Charlie and team, congratulations on a fantastic event. Um, you know, you heard from the speaker about the broader set of transformations. What we're going to focus on is the human aspect of this transformation. Um, I think the term authentic intelligence was used. Um, I think one of the things I've admired, I've known Ashok for a few years now, uh, when he was the CEO of Barclays UK, is how much you've always been focused on what does it mean for people? What does AI mean for human beings? There's nothing artificial about AI. It's about impacting people. So what might be useful is to get us going. Perhaps you can talk about taking on a new role. And in that role, how do you see the, the role that AI will play, and then we'll dig into how do you trust AI. Uh, so first of all, Manoj, thank you. Uh, great to be here. Uh, what an amazing uh, turnout. Congratulations, Charlie. Uh, look, there's no doubt, and I think Salim touched upon it, there's no doubt that uh, technology is disrupting financial services. And it's not really technology that's disrupting financial services. It's the consumer that is disrupting financial services. It's how the consumer today communicates, entertains, works, uh, and when he or she does everything in a different way, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's not possible for us to tell the consumer, hey, by the way, when it comes to your banking, forget about all this, remember the old ways, and do it in the old ways. And therefore, uh, getting it right with the consumer is what is really, really critical. So to your point, uh, Manoj, it really comes down to two things. Every company spends a lot of money on technology. We sure do. 
Uh, in fact, I've heard that financial services spends more money on technology than technology companies themselves. Yeah. Uh, so that's quite a quite a quite a comment. Uh, I think the real secret sauce is how do you move the culture and the mindset of the organization, and that's where the people equation comes in. How do you get the culture and the mindset in the organization correct? And then two, you know, technology for the sake of technology is interesting, but technology that has an impact. And therefore, what is the impact for the customer? Yeah. How do you keep the customer at the center of everything that you do is what I think is important. And that's why the people element or the human element of all of this is so critical. I think, I think that's the part I want to drill into a little bit more. You know, I have gone from a raging enthusiast on AI. You know, I had the privilege of running IBM Watson as the first general manager for the first three years. And then now, about two years ago, I sort of did a little bit of a transition in my thinking that there is a naive belief that AI will solve everything. Um, AI, I call it as AI equals artificially inflated, <laughs> uh, you know, as well as AI is amazing innovations. Uh, both are going on right now. So in your, in your view, uh, unless you bring in the humans, unless you bring in the culture, unless you demystify AI in terms of business outcomes, I don't think we're going to make a lot of progress in, in terms of really making it practical. So as you look at it from a Barclays perspective, where are the points where you see AI will start having impact? And when I define AI, I mean it's a feedback-driven, transparent system. You know, everything we have built so far, if it doesn't learn, it's not an AI. If it's not transparent and trustworthy, it's not a practical AI. So when you look at it from a Barclays perspective, what processes or what points of engagement with people do you see AI starting to have some impact? So Manoj, it's not going to come as a surprise to anybody that you know we kind of agree. We've gone to folks like Manoj. Manoj has been a huge partner to help us think about uh, think about the use of artificial intelligence, not only in financial services, but Manoj has been helping us think about artificial intelligence broadly, particularly under the circumstances that we find ourselves in the UK. Uh, you know, we've tried to identify industries which uh, will define competitive advantage for the UK going forward. And through our Eagle Labs, how do we kind of promote AI? Because I think AI is going to be so transformational to it. And Manoj has been an incredible partner to help us think through that. And as, as we kind of think about it, look, I completely agree that AI is not like, you know, a panacea for all evils. You come back to the question saying, fundamentally, what is this going to do? And how is it going to help my customer? So, you know, uh, I, think, I think one of the things that we've kind of talked about is think about medicine. And if you think about medicine, maybe going back 100, 150 years, uh, and sometimes, you know, my old grandmother still will prescribe a medicine which is so unique and so pointed to exactly what is happening to me. And then medicine gets into the stage of mass production, completely mass production. So you take a pill, for God knows how many kind of things, right? You take a paracetamol for, you know, a headache, a cold, right down to flu, blah, 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 blah. And now we've come again back, which basically says, how does that medicine become hyper relevant? And I take the same example in financial services. Each one of us, each one of us has certain hopes and aspirations. Each one of us needs the confidence to be able to meet that hope and aspiration. What is it that we can do? to design stuff uniquely, uniquely for the person. Yeah. And if we can use artificial intelligence to be able to pick up stuff which allows us to get a better understanding, I think that's really, to my mind, the holy grail. Yeah, no, I think, uh, to me, that's one of the exciting applications, is hyper-personalization, uh, but with transparency. So one of the things that I have, over the last two or three years, started having this other dimension that's come up, Yes, you can use AI to hyper-personalize based on declared, observed, and inferred behaviors, but I think Facebook changed everything. This whole algorithms and this fake news, and uh, so there is a massive amount of distrust, and there is a massive amount of regulatory uh, pressures I think we will start seeing over the next few years, which could serve as a significant headwind for AI. One, I think, the hype and misperception of AI, Second is data issues and challenges around AI. And third is some of this trust issues around AI. Are the three headwinds I see slowing down the excitement or impact of AI? So let's dig a little deeper into this trusted aspect of AI. 
Um, how do you see the customer's expectation on AI in terms of, you know, uh, be it a chat bot, be it a mobile app, how is the AI engaging me? And how do you see the regulators uh, getting into enabling transparent and trusted AI? Yeah, so, so this, is a, this is a fascinating subject, right? And one of the first things we did, even before we got into AI, what are the applications, what are the use cases, one of the first things we did was we said we're going to put down a charter, right? How do we think about the ethics of AI, right? And it's built around those principles, right? It's built around the principles of high levels of transparency. It's built around the principle of the North Star always being the customer, right? Whatever we do, we're going to do for value added to the customer. We're going to do it in a transparent fashion. We're going to do it in an understandable fashion. Yeah. And we're going to do it with a high level of transparency. So when we are using anything to do with artificial intelligence, the customer is aware of the fact that we're using artificial intelligence. And finally, we're going to do it to make it understandable, right? We are never ever going to allow this to become a black box. Because if I can't explain it, I'm not going to offer it, yeah. right? And this is really, really important, and that's where we kind of started. And the customer, as long as the customer sees real benefit, not perceived benefit, real benefit, the customer will adopt to it. Yeah. Now, as far as it comes to the regulator, what, look, I always feel that when I get up in the morning, I'm coming to work looking to do the right thing for my customer. Frankly, the regulator is doing the same thing. The regulator basically wants you to look after the customer. So if that is the case, there is no ray of light between me and the regulator, right? And shame on me if I'm not being able to think of something and the regulator has thought about it, yeah. right? So I always tell my team, look, if you keep the customer as a North Star, right? Keep the customer as a North Star. What is in it for the customer? Yeah. If you can answer that question, everything else will get taken care of, yeah. including the financials, by the way. Because if, the financial, if, if you're not taking care of the customer and you're making some money out of it, I can assure you it is not sustainable. Yeah. So, so let me ask you, um, you know, one of the things I'm beginning to see in AI, the couple of shifts. One is there is a shift from machine learning oriented project because people confuse AI with machine learning, right? And the reality is machine learning is less than 20% of the models in really building an AI system. Most of them are statistical models. Many of them are rule sets. How do you compose and orchestrate all of this to create a prediction or to create an insight that is understandable? Um, so I think I'm seeing two shifts happening in companies. One is the focus of AI is moving from the machine learning groups to the CIOs and CTOs. Because they are the ones who have to productionize this stuff. They have to scale this stuff. And the second thing over the last nine months is I'm beginning to see more and more chief compliance officers and chief risk officers because of the reputational damage, because of bias and unintended consequences of AI. Microsoft even declared in their annual report last year, AI as a business risk to their stock price. So speak a little bit to, from a, purely from a risk and governance perspective, how does Barclays look at AI inside out? And what are some of the challenges there? Yeah, so Manoj, uh, you know, technology and digital and all of these kind of trends, frankly, they're just too important to be left to the technologist. Absolutely. Number two, yes. technology can no longer be a horizontal on the organization chart. It is clearly a vertical on the, uh, on the organization chart. And three, you know, as things are kind of, you know, uh, customer needs, the way we do business, the way we define business, all of that is blurring, right? What are the, I mean, you can keep going back and asking the question, what business are you in? And you can see that, you know, it's blurring very, very fast. The only thing I know is if I'm not eating out of somebody else's lunchbox, I'm going to go hungry <laughs> because somebody sure is eating out of my lunchbox, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah. And therefore, this notion, this old traditional notion of, you know, reputation management is something that compliance has to do, making money is what, you know, sales or marketing has to do, that has to kind of go away. There is only one North Star, that's the customer. All of us are in service of the customer, Yeah. right? Yeah. And if you're doing something that adds value to the customer, it's value added. If you're not, it's a waste of time, Yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. And if you're wasting your time, sooner or later, you'll get rid of. How do you take this as a business issue, right? Why am I using AI? How am I going to become more effective at it? Clearly, there's a lot of hard work. I mean, it's so sexy to talk about AI. The hard work 
you know, getting the data right, getting the data cleansed, having the architecture, the standards, the processes, moving that data to the cloud, because if you want to do that kind of an analytics, moving it to the cloud. Now, moving stuff to the cloud is not an easy thing to do. Yeah. How do you manage multi-cloud environments, right? How do you manage, you know, resiliencies? How do you manage secret data? How do you manage all of this kind of good stuff? I, I've been talking to so many people, including you, saying, Manoj, give me an answer, right? Even smart people like you <laughs> are saying it's taking us time to figure these things out. It's only then you start saying, I can come up with insights, and then it's the delivery of the insight at the edge, right? How do you really deliver it where it meets the customer? So it's a long, complicated process. I don't think it can happen in two or three days or you know, in five days. This is something that the company has to think through, and we're spending a lot of time thinking through this, yeah. right? It's better to take measured steps rather than, you know, make a mistake and have to redo everything. Yeah, no, I think, I think that's very well put because AI is turning out to be a double-edged sword, right? And the difference is, you know, like you can use a knife to cut and prepare a meal or you can use a knife to hurt someone. Uh, the thing I'm beginning to see is because of rogue AI, rogue ways of which models and systems are being built, you have these little chuckies running around with a knife in the hand doing things to your IT system that your traditional risk was a lot lesser with a rules-based system. Because it's a self-learning, self-evolving system, the amount of risk goes up quite a bit. And up here on the chart, you know, uh, we at, at Cognitive Scale, we have identified five different categories in which AI is going to be you know, detrimental to your business. And I do believe that innovation has to be put around some guardrails. And the guardrails go from everything from data to black box. What people don't realize is 90 plus percent of machine learning models are black boxes. It's one thing to say it's a dog or a cat on the internet using an AI model. It's another thing to say, I denied a claim, the patient died, I'm getting sued, and I can't explain why my AI said what it said. So I think there is a big shift going on from research grade AI to business grade AI. And I think it'll go further to consumer grade AI, which is can the consumer trust you? So as you look out over the next um, two to three years for Barclays, where do you see the, the biggest area? So one was hyper-personalization. So the customer gets experiences that are hyper-relevant and they trust. Where do you see some of the big capabilities that you all need to build out in Barclays to, to sort of completing your vision? Is it at the cloud level? Is it a data level? Is it culture? People, ecosystems, where is it, or all of it? Yeah. yeah. So, so, so Manoj, I think I think the most important thing is ultimately what is in it for the customers. So what's the north star? I think we've defined that. Having defined that, you say, how do you go about doing that? And I think the, the first and the most important thing then was to put down the uh, what are the ethical elements of AI? What are the charter against which we're going to use? And that's the charter that we've kind of spent a lot of time. And the team has done a fantastic job. Uh, evaluating that charter against the Monetary Authority of Singapore, uh, the, the financial regulator in Australia. Both those regulators, I think, are a little ahead of any other country in the world, uh, at least as far as it comes to AI. Mm. Uh, we've been talking and seeing and looking at what's happening in the EU. Obviously, we are affected a lot by the EU, uh, and then, of course, the UK and the US. So really taking a global view and saying, does our charter stand up to that? Once the charter stands up to that, that guides a lot of our stuff. That's the guardrails that you're talking about. Then I think the most important aspect of it is culture. Yeah. Right? How do we get our business leaders to really start thinking about the applicability of AI and what needs to change? From there, it's not, you know, it's not really doesn't take a rocket scientist to say, you've got to set up the data standards, the data processes. How do you get clean data? How do you think about customer data and privacy? How do you take all that data out of the cloud? Yeah. What cloud do you use? How do you get into a multi-cloud environment? Where do you store? Where do you compute? Where do you display, right? And then how do you build the final guardrails to the edge? That's, that's beautiful, the way you laid out. Customers to guidelines, to culture, to technology. Unfortunately, most technology companies start the other way around. They start technology and data up rather than customer and values. And that, I think, is one of the big changes that, that needs to come about before we put this to work successfully. Um, I just want to be mindful of our time. I want, I want to see if there's any final comment or advice to companies and startups and uh, 
you know, colleagues of yours in the industry as Barclay starts putting trusted AI to work? Yeah. So I don't know about advice. I think we are early on in this game, so I'm not going to give advice. But I think that this is an area where, uh, you know, the weakest link will define what happens. And therefore, I think there is a real opportunity for all of us to think about this together in, uh, you know, things like, you know, ethical charters, things like how do we put guardrails around this, things like saying this is what we'll not do versus this is what we'll do, uh, I think is very, very, uh, very important. Manoj, you'd know this, but it's uh, fascinating. Uh, Barclays has put together a program where we take a lot of our senior executives uh, to Stanford. And uh, the Stanford professors come down to the UK. We go to the campus once a week, uh, once for one week in a year. And so we went there last year. 50 of us were in Stanford for a week. Mm. And going in, I thought, my God, I'm going to get amazed by some new technology which we've never heard about, completely kind of forgotten about it. And my God, there was nothing on the technology front. The only thing that kept coming up through that week was culture. And it is so hard to work on that, right? Yeah. And therefore, I completely agree with the comment. Let's not start with the technology. Let's start at the front end of the customer, the guardrails, and then the culture. That's wonderful. Again, thank you for your well, time. Well, and we thanks look a lot. To thank you so your... much for your support. Um, absolutely. Thanks. Paul. We'll be needing one of these. Right, can we please welcome to the stage the fantastic Manuela Veloso from JP Morgan, who's going to talk about how humans and machines interact. Thank you, Manuela. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to tell a little bit about this AI research at JP Morgan. Uh, several of you may know that I actually have been at Carnegie Mellon University for more than 30 years, and I just joined JP Morgan last year almost one year ago, and so it has been a fascinating kind of one year of finding out what the real world, after all, is all about. So I'm going to share with you a little bit about JP Morgan, very short, and then go through four technical uh, uh, projects that we are working at JP Morgan that are very exciting, and I would like to share them with you. So why is JP Morgan such a beautiful place to work on AI? It's because it's gigantic. So it's a place that has many people, 250,000 uh, people. My lab at Carnegie Mellon was 30 people, and CMU altogether is probably 10,000 people. So getting to a place that is 250,000 employees is overwhelming and beautiful. And then there is a lot of like uh, clients, these customers that uh, Ashok was mentioning, this, problem, this issue about having to interact with people, with companies, with all sorts of levels, of, and that's really fascinating. And then there is this issue that uh, because of this operation is gigantic, there's a lot of data. So these are aspects I'll focus on, but they have been taken by sleep at night uh, throughout this year, thinking about these problems. So when we started this AI research, uh, we wanted to, fo uh, to follow or to est uh, establish some pillars uh, for the research in the, the company itself. So we developed these four principles, these four principles, these pillars on learning from experience, this thing that uh, we were so well mentioning before about systems that are deployed AI systems as literally uh, machines that need to learn from experience. So it's not just the data feed into some neural net and eventually some classification comes out or some action comes out. It's about this continuum that it's part of your life and it learns through feedback, through more data, through correction, through instruction. What is this paradigm of having really something that accompanies your journey as a human, as a professional, as a worker? So that's part of how we build, that's part of how we decide uh, we work on things at JP Morgan. The other one is actually this problem of explainability, which again was, has been touched. But let me tell you something about explainability that, we, uh, that uh, again, uh, drives our research very much. Explainability is really about one way, of course, uh, how do you say, producing explainability, explanations for humans, but it's a, a programming problem. We have been in the AI business uh, 
of producing solutions to problems. What's the next move in chess? What is like this diagnose? What is uh, the next, the route you should take? What is the result of this search? It's all about the product, the outcome, and very little in our algorithms tracks the reasoning, tracks the reasoning. That explanation has to be generated in our if-then-else statement, in our objects, in our calls, in our libraries. That's a problem at the engineering level. There are many people that think about it at the human level. I put my engineering hat, I put my computer science hat, and there's where I think the, the real challenge also is. How do we extract these explanations from a search that goes up and down uh, tuning parameters and then plateaus and then goes up and down again and eventually converges to something in a very stable way? What is the explanation? So we are fascinated by that problem from a, an internal of the AI problem and how do we find that uh, internals of AI and ML. Then there is this issue that actually I never thought it was going to be so compelling, which is data. This data problem of actually uh, being able to use real-time data, to being able to actually use AI to create data that is useful in a secure and multimodal, connect all these different from addresses to social security numbers to amounts to interest rates to actually uh, all sorts of like uh, other values of the state of the problem. It's from an AI point of view a big challenge because we are great at, at processing somehow uh, very, very uniform information. When we try to combine the color of, of your dress with the temperature in the environment with the news on the sub newspaper, wow, these algorithms get all very confused. And even if the, we are working on multimodal solutions, there is a lot more to do. So data is this be beautiful and, how do you say, challenging area of AI in the firm. And then last but not least is this kind of like trying to understand how do we train systems using data that's behavioral from humans, and after all, we still would like these uh, systems to have, show ethics and values and fairness. So here are the four pillars that JP Morgan AI researched in 2019. As I keep going there, these pillars may change, but basically this is what we are pushing, and uh, now you know what drives AI research at JP Morgan. Now I'm going to share a very beautiful kind of like new thing, I think. Okay, so this is the news today. Then I tell, tell three more things, but as I see Amir there, he, I told you we're going to say something new. I'm going to tell you what happened. So I was taken to the floor, the trading floor at JP Morgan, actually here in London. I, am, uh, my, I work in New York City, but I was here in London. And what is this trading floor? So for me, it was, oh my God, the trading floor, beautiful. We are used to see it on movies. Uh, but it's actually like that. You enter like a big floor, and there are all these people with all these screens around, tons of screens. I've never seen so many screens in my life together. And they very kindly took me to one of the desks, and this very nice trader was explaining to me uh, all the information that was on all these screens, all these little kind of like functions, plus the blogs, plus these, and I was amazed. And the only thing I could think was like this. How do humans make decisions like this? How in the world do we process all this information? And no matter what he said, the only thing that I was looking is like this. They are not with a paper and pencil making computations. They are looking at the screen. And magically, I thought, what if we transform this problem of making decisions to, again, what AI lately has been proven to be so successful as training and classifying images. So what I did is instead of using all the math algorithms that have been used in financial services to make estimates of where the stock goes up and down, tons of algorithms on boundaries, variances, you name it, signal processing, a lot of things, we took pictures of the time series pictures of the time series. We call the project Mondrian. So basically I told I was like in, uh, involved in this and I told, I came back up to my, uh, my, you know, this is the power of being a researcher 30 years in academia is that you innovate. So I came up and said, guess what? Forget about this trading thing. 
this time series. Let's take pictures of those screens. Let's transform a time series into an image. And guess what? I was not sure if this image, which happens to be, well, we did 100 by 100 pixels, and mostly white with a few black dots that capture the time series, I did not know if the neural net was going to be able to learn that signal. I did not know. It was basically just a, not a cat, not a dog, but just da, 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 some kind of like black thing going up, one line on the screen. So, I mean, I, we didn't sleep for one week, I think, because we were so excited. So we actually transformed it to a little bit more than just uh, a line. We had this candle representation, very common in financial services, black and white. It doesn't matter with these little lines to know whether it's going up or down. We train a neural net and we got 95% accuracy on the system deciding to buy or not buy based on images of stocks. Can you imagine how beautiful this is? It is. I mean, it's transformational for us. And I, I really want you to appreciate this, to think about images not of cats and dogs and trees and bikes and bananas and oranges and you name it, objects, which is what I've been doing in robotics for an eternity, but other things. And I tell you one thing, and I share this with you. I mean, I, we don't have, we, are, we actually filed a patent for this, but it doesn't matter. But I'll share you something. How do you have a doctor make decisions on you so, for so many things? We are on a treadmill doing a stress test, and there comes a doctor, and there is something coming out of some machine, some like lines coming out of some machine. And what does the doctor do? She looks at that thing and says, heart problem, take this medicine. Unbelievable how much decision making is made based on an image of that thing going up and down. I cannot, you cannot imagine how much I look now at images for decision making. I was in a university recently, and while I was waiting for the elevator behind me was an earthquake kind of uh, center. And it, the amount of images of little things going up and down that actually had the pattern. Do you understand? So now you can open this door to the power of machine learning with deep learning, not to just do cats and dogs but to do other things, anything that you represent as an image, classify it. And I tell you, we'll go far, because we humans make a lot of like a, a decision based on things that we actually can represent visually. There's a phenomenal paper that I, I assign as homework number one today for you to guys to read in back in the early 60s, I believe, called uh, a picture is worth a thousand words, uh, but it's like by Herb Simon on explaining the value of reasoning using pictures. For example, when we do in computation pulleys, you know, like five kilos here, and then a pulley very long, and another pulley, and so forth. I mean, if you do not represent it as an image, Wow, it's very hard to say the left side of the pulley has five kilos, the right side lies three meters long. You can't, except the image you do in two minutes, five times two, ten, blah, blah. And then, this is like the most interesting thing. But I also tell you another very interesting thing. So this is like Mondrian, okay? Amir, this was the news. And then the next one, which was very interesting again, is this problem of explanations. So people make decisions, and in JP Morgan, and in many of our environments, it's so much based on screens. And again, people look. So again, I looked at this, and we have this eye gaze tracking, and through eye gaze tracking, you know the sequence of places where people looked at. From that eye gaze tracking, and from the sequence, we generate the explanation why eventually something was decided. Very interesting also to use the visual attention of a person as a sequence to extract the rationale. This is, can also use, be used for training. It can be also be used to see which are the most valuable assets on your screen that you pay more attention to or less attention to. Again, 
uh, trying to innovate the way that we look at how we apply AI to a big uh, company in the financial services. Then the last uh, thing that I also want to tell you about, again, just to share with you this innovation, is payments. So we got, uh, well, 3 billion payments for some period of time, and it's all at, at JP Morgan, the data is always billions, millions, trillions. <laughs> it's kind of overwhelming, and it's not really like, okay, three things you have done, and how do you go about looking at them? It's trillions, billions. So again, when people say, oh, AI will have another winter, AI, AI will never have an, another winter, and why? because we are not giving up on data. Everything we do, Fitbits, GPS, it's everything is data, and there is no way, no way for humans to be able to process that amount of data without some automation, without some AI algorithms. So we are able to look at these payments, and I don't have yet the results, but I'm sharing with you what this is. The payments is actually motion, motion of, happens to be, assets, money, from one place to another, but it's the same thing as Waze. It's the same thing as us doing motion planning for robotics. We can think about the routes. Where is the map of all the banks, of all the, the accounts of the world? It's a finite number. It can be gigantic, but it's finite. Then you can build routes. You actually can find traffic, volume. You can find actually who does what, one-way streets, two-way streets, communication, cost, and we are looking at this problem of all this information as also very prone to AI algorithms we have developed in the past. The last one that I want to mention is another area that is beautiful, which is trying to now do machine learning in these uh, multi-party uh, secure computation because that this involves the ability to really uh, use AI, machine learning, and try to do this in a secure way. Another area very beautiful. And finally, last but not least, I want to tell you about the simulation environments. We are building, so well, let me tell you, when we are at the bank, at JP Morgan and other places, it's very hard to use the real data, and absolutely impossible to actually play and explore and experiment with the real data. Many of the techniques of AI, including reinforcement learning, are based on exploration, are based on us flipping coins, randomizing, learning from random decisions, and finding out what's best. The power of reinforcement learning is not just the reward, it's the exploration. It enables you to go into parts of the space that eventually the data has never shown you and you can learn better policies by exploring. This is impossible in the real world. I cannot tell you like this, okay, invest this much amount of money so that I just experiment with that. So we are not able in the real world, the same thing in the health domain, we cannot experiment in real problems. So we have to build these simulations and we are building a multi-agent simulation of mainly all the action of uh, trading in the bank, multi-agent for the first time. And then uh, we build also a digital platform, very important that all these services, we are putting them all into a platform that enables our clients and ourselves to really build upon uh, these uh, ability, all these components we are building, and hopefully are reusable, and hopefully they can be like of use to decision making of clients and us. So, we created a community at JP Morgan that we called We AI and ML at JP Morgan. I think it's the first time that the term AI is used as a verb. And I feel very proud of this, that we are We AI, which means We AI. I mean, that's it. What do you do? We AI. And We AI and ML at JP Morgan combines people throughout the distributed firm, be it all the way in India, Singapore, Israel, Europe, the United States, Africa, everywhere, towards trying to use these AI techniques to improve the efficiency and to try to solve this problem of making the companies better for our clients. And if you want to send me email, 
we are recruiting. I'm hiring. So if you have, uh, if you want to come for a tenure at JP Morgan, I'll take you also for a visit. Uh, anything you want to collaborate with us, I'm open to it. And thank you very much for your attention.